yeah. or she could do 325 as a joint yeah. and when she passes then it would continue for me uh, yeah is that a good deal or not well, it depends. Uh, you know, I typically like to keep the lump sum just because, you know, then although you assume the responsibility for its performance, one of the benefits is then, you know, you can uh, not only gain control of the investments, but you could access the money if you need it in a larger amount. You also have something to leave to your heirs. Uh, but there is, for some folks, a peace of mind to know that they don't have to take any risk and they can get a guaranteed payout for their life, a single life or a single life plus a spouse. And, and that was the difference of $100 between the 425 and the 325. What is the balance on that account, Gary, today, roughly? I believe it's 65000 Okay. So at $65,000, I mean, we would typically say if you were to invest that conservatively in retirement, you'd probably, you know, try to pull out 4% a year, you know, 4% a year on 65,000 would, you know, would, would generate about $215 a month. So less than the 325, certainly less than the 425, um, but you should be able to maintain that 65,000 with that approach, meaning you get to the end of your li her life or her life plus yours, and you still got 65,000, maybe a little bit more, um, that could be left to ministry or charity or your heirs. Um, and you've got the full balance left that you could tap into if you guys needed long-term care, you know, which could, with skilled nursing care, could run you nine or $10,000 a month. I mean, if there's something that's gonna erode your assets in this season of life, it's probably most often going to be expensive long-term uh, care needs. So that's why I kind of like the benefit of keeping the lump sum available to you and not converting it to an income stream. And I'd probably hire an advisor to manage that for you where you're, you're trying to minimize the risk, still have a growth component, get a lot of income generated through bonds, corporate and government, that type of thing, maybe some dividend paying stocks, but you still you know, have access to your money. But where folks will sometimes say, no, I'd rather have the monthly payout either for a single life or single life plus spouse is where there's a shortfall in their monthly uh, income in this season of life. So their bills are a little bit more than social security or whatever other income sources you have. And that monthly check is gonna close that gap. So they know, okay, well, at least for the rest of my life, I know I've got enough to cover my bills every month and I don't have to think about the market. I don't have to think about any of that. Does that all make sense to you? Yes, sir. And uh, I have uh, medical coverage through the VA. Also, I did good on my Social Security. I, I get a pretty good check together at $3,400 okay. a month. Okay. We have money left over, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I think if it were me, just based on the limited information I have, Gary, I would not take this option that's going to cause this money to essentially evaporate at your death uh, or her death plus yours, um, where you know you, you guys have control over it. You can invest it how you want. You can still draw an income from it, but it sounds like you don't need it. So let's just let it grow, and then you'll have something down the road you could tap into or give it away. Uh, thank you very much. That's what I told her, but I just wanted some confirmation there. So right. you have a blessed day, and thank you very much. You you as well, Gary. Thanks for calling today. We appreciate it. Uh, 800 525 is the number to call. We've got some lines open. Uh, let's head to a first-time caller in Texas. Hi, George. Go ahead, sir. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for calling. Well, thank you for taking my call. I appreciate that. Uh, my question was that I applied for Social Security. I did that online. I got it coming. Um, it, the letter said that it's going to be in September. The only thing is, is that I never gave them a, a uh, checking account number or something to deposit that. Well, I get a check in the mail. You will, yeah. So if you don't give the Social Security Administration your bank account information for direct deposits, uh, then you will get a paper check. You, you don't know when that would be. They said in September. I, I've had people tell me it's the third Wednesday of uh, every month, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so when did you file for it? 
Well, that was June 6th. Okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, they do on the, you know, they typically on the third uh, or fourth. I mean, it depends on a number of factors, but it, it could either be the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, and, and it really depends on when you were born. So you could go online and, and figure that out as to when that will be coming in just based on your birthday. Okay. All right. Yeah, I filed June, I was 66 February 25th, 1957 is when I was born. Um, so I was told I had to wait like four months or something like that. So that's why I went to June. Um, but anyway, okay, so you're confident they will be coming in the mail. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's paid one month in arrears though. Uh, so, you know, you'll have to wait for that, that check to come based on when you filed for it. But yeah, you will be getting that in the, in the mail. And if you'd rather get the direct deposit, you can always go online at ssa.gov and sign up for that direct deposit if at any point you wanted to switch. Excellent. Man, I surely enjoy your show. God bless you. God bless your ministry. It is a ministry. And uh, yeah, God bless all your listeners as well. Uh, and God bless America. No one leave that out. That's for sure. I I concur on all fronts. Uh, we we can we will certainly take God's blessing. That's that's exactly right, George. Listen, thanks for being on the program, sir, and for your kind remarks about the program. We appreciate it. May the Lord bless you. Well, folks, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. Uh, Jerry Boyer will stop by. We always look forward to Jerry's visit each Friday. He's our resident economist, and Jerry always has some insightful analysis on what's going on or the lack thereof <laughs> in our economy and the market. Markets. markets green across the board today, not by much. Uh, uh, Dow Jones barely in positive, terri positive territory. The S&P up about a half a percent. The NASDAQ is the outperformer today at almost 1% higher. But we'll get Jerry's take on uh, where things are going. What about an oil spike ahead? And how about the Ukraine war? And also some corporate engagement updates. That and more with Jerry Boyer. We'll be right back. Our thanks to Certified Kingdom Advisor Wade Chessman, President and Wealth Advisor, and his team at Chessman Wealth Strategies in Dallas for their support of faith and finance. Their goal is to help their clients expand their understanding of biblical financial principles and how to implement them. The website is ChessmanWealth.com. The phone number is 214-572-2120. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Resentment is careful to keep the books, which it reads and rereads, hoping for a chance somehow to get even. Love doesn't keep any books because it has no place for resentment or grudges. Don't miss Dr. David Jeremiah's message, Love's Power Over Resentment, on the next Turning Point Weekend Edition. Listen to Turning Point, Sunday mornings at 7 o'clock Central on American Family Radio. Absolutely free. We know you've learned to be suspicious of those words, but really, you can get biblical financial wisdom delivered to your inbox each week absolutely free. Articles, videos, podcasts, and special offers on biblical resources. Nearly 60,000 people receive our free weekly wisdom email, and you can too. Create your free FaithFi account by going to faithfi.com and click sign up to begin receiving weekly wisdom in your inbox. We are grateful for support from Sound Mind Investing in the Faith and Finance Program. If you have money in a retirement account or just a general investing account, you know the stock market can sometimes seem like a roller coaster. But it is possible to enjoy both profit and peace of mind in investing, no matter what's happening in the market. You can see a short video webinar on that topic at soundmindinvesting.org. Since 1990, Sound Mind Investing has sought to offer financial wisdom for living well. Soundmindinvesting.org. Thanks for joining us today on Faith and Finance on American Family Radio. It's a Friday. I'm Rob West, but that means Jerry Boyer stops by with our market update. Jerry's our resident economist and all-around smart guy that we bring on the program once a week. Uh, good morning, Jerry. 
So I'm the round, smart guy. No, no, all, all around. All, <laughs> all, all, all around. I see. I got it. <laughs> Just g generally speaking, very, very smart is all I was saying. <laughs> and fairly round. <laughs> I don't know about that. Hey, Jerry, uh, tell us what's going on in the markets this week. Obviously, All Eyes Wednesday, we're on the Fed. Uh, we expected they wouldn't raise rates, but what about those comments? Well, the comments were what what they call hawkish. I don't know why, you know, tighter money is hawkish and looser money is dovish. I don't know where yeah, they where got that. Where does that come from, way, Jerry? Why, yeah, and why is a up market a bull and a down market a bear? I, 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 who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how, how what about that button? Of, what about that buttonwood tree too? What's the deal there? Yeah, I don't know any of that stuff. It, 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 um, but it was it was hawkish, which is to say that you know um, they didn't hike rates then, but they were indicating uh, they're, they're more likely to hike rates in the future, or at the very least, markets were expecting them to cut sooner. Uh, so maybe like one more hike and then they start cutting, uh, which is kind of weird. Like, oh, interest rates raise, 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 cut, 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 cut. That seems kind of like unstable leadership to me. Yeah. Um, and we know that because this is James, the unstable mind, uh, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways because they have a dual mandate um, and the two, the two mandates conflict with one another. The one mandate says what you want to do is you fight inflation by right raising unemployment. And then the other mandate says, oh, you got to cut unemployment. <laughs> you got to keep employment going. Well, yeah. wait a minute, that causes inflation. Well, then we're going to go. So they go back and forth like a seesaw. Uh, it's, I mean, these are some of the smartest people in the world if you go by IQ or SAT score. And there's such foolishness in the policy. I mean, it's what Paul says about the wisdom of the wise um, is foolishness. Um, so what, we're, that, what we've seen with the markets this week is they're mostly down. Um, and they're down in two ways. One, when all the markets are down, that usually means that the markets think that the Fed is going to pull money out of the system. It's going to pull money out of the financial markets. So stocks and bonds are both down, right? But if stocks are down more than bonds, remember bonds are like the sure thing, especially treasury bonds. Uh, so if people are selling stocks more aggressively than they're selling bonds, that means they're afraid about future growth. Right, because you're, you you make money on stocks largely from dividends, and that depends on economic growth. So the signal this week is, oh, okay, uh, the Fed's not done. The Fed's going to be tighter. They haven't beaten inflation. They know they haven't beaten inflation. So at least that's that's one bit of truth. They know that they didn't beat inflation. They still think they need to slow down the economy to beat inflation. And you know what? They're going to succeed. They're going to slow down the economy. Yeah. Uh, and so the growth sectors and growth sensitive sectors are selling off more than the recession hedges. Hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously, um, you know, as we look at where that target will be based on what we know today, we fully expect that that Fed's 2% target of, uh, well, 2% target is not going to be achieved in 2025 just based on the trajectory, right? I, I would be surprised if we saw 2%, long-term 2% inflation rate for years and years and years. Uh, I mean, they created so much money. The inflationary biases of the public, uh, public policy establishment are very clear. Um, if we get an economic slowdown, what are they going to do? They're going to um, put up with a slowdown? They never do. When you get a growth recession or a real recession, they always um, increase the money supply. Um, it takes a lot of courage, except for Paul Volcker. Uh, Paul, Volcker, Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan. Volcker cut money supply, but Reagan cut taxes to get the economy growing again. So we don't have that now. We have someone not as brave as Paul Volcker at the Fed, and we have someone not nearly as growth-oriented as Ronald Reagan uh, at the head of the federal government. So we don't have that policy mix. Uh, so I just, I don't see how we beat inflation. Now, if we have a when you have a recession, prices go down very temporarily. People are afraid. When you're afraid, you don't buy things, okay? But that's not really beating recession. Frightening people so much yeah. that they you know, cut back, that's not a recession-fighting strategy. Because the moment they're not afraid, they go back to the stores, and they have to pent up the demand, and it just drives prices back up again. So um, the, fear, the fear way of fighting inflation isn't really fighting inflation. It just creates the illusion that you fought inflation when you just deferred it until after the fear is over.
Yeah, yeah. All right. You know, it's interesting. I was just reading some comments by one of the Fed governors today, and uh, you know, they were the quote was, "Policymakers will stay the course to achieve the Fed's mandate." What is the Fed's mandate, Jerry? Well, there the, is the problem. It has two mandates, historic and, well, really three. Um, it, originally, it was created for one purpose and one purpose only, which is if things get really bad, you want to have a lender of last resort. So let's say you have a deep, you had, so you had the uh, panic of 1903, for example, um, and banks were insolvent, and J.P. Morgan Chase and a bunch of other rich guys met in a room, and they said, well, look, we can't let the economy collapse. We're part of the economy. So we will, out of our our personal fortunes we will lend to the ailing banks so they, they so they privately bailed out the economy Teddy Roosevelt looked at that and said I don't like that I don't think that we should be so dependent on these rich people where we need the government to bail out the economy by the way I think that's mistaken I, I don't want the government the government is the taxpayers I don't want us to be bailing out the economy I think the rich guys should be the ones that bail out the economy the owners of the banks should reach into their pockets um, you know when the banks are in trouble I think that system worked for you know almost 200 years but anyway Roosevelt said we need a lender of last resort so we created the Fed but at some point they became sort of the manager of the money supply and then the manager of the economy and then some members of Congress said well wait a minute when you fight inflation you try to slow down the economy but that causes unemployment so you have to fight unemployment too so they have these two conflicting mandates fight inflation by raising employment and fight unemployment by creating inflation and just any given day they decide which of those conflicting mandates they follow I, I think what they ought to do is just sound money and sure um, you know lender of last resort if there's a crisis but frankly if we didn't mismanage the money supply we wouldn't have had the depressions in the first place we don't need a lender of last resort from the government if the government isn't messing up the economy to the point where we have these these crises which then the lenders you know, lend in the midst of yeah well said jerry well wow, yeah that's really helpful all right uh we could talk about that all day uh, let's uh, let's pivot here and i want you to give us an update on what's happening on the corporate engagement front some interesting uh developments out of nike huh yeah, and Nike, would, I think most people would consider it one of the more progressive uh, brands uh, in America. Um, that, for instance, they, you know, they were fine with athletes taking the knee during, or they were fine if they didn't make any business changes. Uh, they defended it, uh, taking a knee during the national anthem, etc. Well, Nike's annual meeting was fascinating. None of that stuff. Uh, there was no, no mention of ESG, environmental social governance, no mention of social causes. Uh, I, we didn't see any rainbow flags, which are ubiquitous in corporate meetings. Um, I mean, from, from, the, from the management, it was really fascinating to see that. And there was also a proposal from activists who are shareholders. And what they wanted Nike to do is to report pay gaps by race and gender. Mm. In other words, how much do say African Americans make compared to um, non-African, you know, to white people? Well, Nike said, we already do that, but we do it adjusted by the job. In other words, we, um, we don't, here is an example. If there's a woman who works in the uh, daycare at Nike, and there's a man who's an engineer, we don't compare their salaries and say, well, she only makes 50% as much as him, therefore Nike is sexist. We compare female engineers to male engineers. We compare female daycare workers to male day daycare workers. And yeah. the same with, with race. And it turns out when they do that, th things are fair. It turns right. out when you compare people of different genders and races in corporate America <laughs> who have the same jobs, they have very similar pay. And these activist groups aren't satisfied with that, and they want to actually use less statistically defensible. They want you to compare jobs that are not the same job, as if it's Nike's fault if more women decide to work for the daycare and more men decide to you know, work as systems analysts. I mean, yeah. for whatever reason, maybe, you know, blame society, or maybe it's just the way God made us. I mean, I'm in here talking to you about economics, and in the next room, my wife is with the grandchildren. I mean, so we chose that. I, she didn't say, oh, no, don't, I don't want it to do the grandchildren. I want to be on Rob's mm -hmm. talking about economics. I chose this, and she chose that freely. And if people make those choices freely, then companies shouldn't be accused of sexism uh, by, by comparing non-comparable jobs. Yeah, and so um, they, they shot it down. By shareholders. 
you know, they, they shot it down. I think that I think that management and shareholders are just sick of this racial and gender um, division stuff. They know that it does not it doesn't create wealth. It doesn't give us good sneakers. It doesn't create good jobs, except for a small number of people whose job is to basically foment conflict. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we'll see if that's maybe the beginning of a trend as some of these companies watch what's going on with Target and Disney and Apple and a whole host of others. Maybe they're uh, taking the cues and getting back to the core business. That would be a, a welcomed uh, development in corporate America. Well, Jerry, grateful for your work, your analysis and insights, and uh, for your willingness to stop by each day and share some of all of that with us. We appreciate it. I appreciate you. That's Jerry Boyer. He's our resident economist. He's president of Boyer Research. You can read his insightful columns and opinions at World News Group. Folks, thanks for being along with us today. We covered a lot of ground. It was a real blessing to be able to chat with you. Thanks for you for your kind remarks about the program. If you'd like to support the work of Faith and Finance on American Family Radio, you can head to faithfi.com. Just click Give. And while you're there, check out the Faith Fi app. Just click on the App tab to learn how you can stay on track with your finances finances and perhaps in a way you haven't ever before. Let me say thanks to my team today, Robert Youngblood, Devin Patrick, and Jim Henry. Couldn't do it without them. I'm Rob West. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. 90.5 KTXG Greenville, Dallas. Alerts. When you subscribe, we'll notify you once or twice a week about a critical issue facing our country. AFA Action Alerts have been very successful in influencing legislation, as well as getting positive results from America's Fortune 500 companies. Subscribe to your AFA Action Alerts today. Go to afa.net and click on the Resources tab. This is American Family Radio, a listener-supported ministry of the American Family Association. fiscal year before it shuts down on September 30th. South Carolina Republican Congressman Ralph Norman explains what it will take to pass those bills. A lot of them have gone through committees already, but it's always been about the number. And there's just a core group of us that economic security is national security. We're tired of it. Border Patrol officials in Texas say they encountered 10,000 migrants crossing illegally on Wednesday. And what does the White House have to say? What do you call it here at the White House when 10,000 people illegally cross the border in a single day? So what do you call it here when GOP puts forth a... a, a wait, no. No, 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 no. You can't. I'm answering... Okay, we're going to move on. No, 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 we're moving on. Irene Armendariz Jackson is the candidate for Congress in El Paso. She says Biden created this mess, and it was done on purpose. The buck stops with Biden. He's never cared about Americans. I'm just flabbergasted at the fact that we are so ignored. People in El Paso are desperate to not be ignored and to be able to bring the truth forward. And I blame the Democrats, but number one, I blame Biden. On day one in office, he definitely opened the border. Convicted killer Alec Murdoch pleaded guilty Thursday in federal court to multiple financial fraud counts. More from Gertel Scott. Murdoch's admission of first to any of the counts he has faced is likely to guarantee him decades behind bars. How long will that be and when that word will come will be determined later, according to federal prosecutor Emily Limehouse. In court, Murdoch said he entered the guilty plea because he wanted his son to see him take responsibility. In addition to federal counts and his life sentence for murder, Murdoch is staring at more than 100 state crimes he must answer for. Bernal Scott, Fox News. A family looks for answers after a Minnesota hospital allows a stranger to make end-of-life decisions for a man who died. 
Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis is accused of allowing a stranger to make the decision to take 64-year-old Mark Hatcher off life support. He died last week after suffering seizures. When he was brain dead, that's when we should have been contacted. Jennifer Wicker telling Fox affiliate KMSP that the family wasn't notified until after her father's death. That HCMC claims a family member named Daryl Moore made the end-of-life decision. She says the family doesn't know a Daryl Moore. They took our final moments from us. They took him being surrounded by his loved one. HCMC working with the family to get Hatcher's medical records, though not saying much else at this point, citing privacy concerns. Jeff Manasso, Fox News. A law firm has concerns about a university's diversity, equity, and inclusion regime. Chris Woodward has more. Attorney Stacy Skanke of Goldwater Institute says Arizona State University is illegally training their professors on concepts such as how white supremacy was written into the foundational documents of our nation and is normalized in society today. They're also taking one of the nation's top journalism schools and indoctrinating its students with this DEI material. We have sent two demand letters um, on these two issues addressing DEI in, in different ways. Most notably is the spending of public money and requiring faculty and staff to take the DEI training, which is against state law. And they also have not complied with certain public records requests that also relate to other DEI that is being taught to the students. There is no specific deadline for Arizona State University to comply. Skanky says Goldwater is giving them all opportunities to comply with the law. And we do hope that they do, um, but if they don't, they are exposed to the potential for litigation. AFN is seeking comment from Arizona State University. Meanwhile, this is not Goldwater Institute's first fight against diversity, equity, and inclusion. The Arizona-based law firm has had recent successes in Florida and in Texas. I'm Chris Woodward. A storm moving closer to the U.S. East Coast will deliver tropical storm conditions to North Carolina today. More news online at AFN.net. I'm Rusty Keaton. The loss of a child through an abortion affects the emotional health of families. Feelings of anger, sadness, and regret can be overwhelming. But there is hope and healing in the aftermath. Call the International Helpline at 866-482-LIFE to talk with someone who has been where you are and healed to help others. Your call is confidential. 866-482-LIFE. It's First Time Caller Day on Trivia Friday. The number to call with your question or your answer to a question is 888-589-8840. It is first time callers, so start lining up, folks. If you've never been on the show with us, today could be your day. So first time callers only today. Now we're going to ask three questions each. The quack of a duck does not produce an echo. Is that true or false? It falls under the category of, it's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Trivia Friday, Learning University on American Family Radio. Happy Friday. I'm JJ Jasper. Normally, the three amigos, Tim Wildman, Ed Vitagliano, and yours truly, JJ Jasper. But Tim and Ed are out, so we're joined by a longtime veteran of Trivia Friday, Brother Bert Harper. Thank you. It's good to be with you, JJ. And, and, uh, and three then also, amigos. Yes. So you're going to name us something else. Yeah, we may, okay, we may. Okay, we'll need find to do out. That. Okay. And then um, my boss and longtime friend, Jonathan Coker, general manager of American Family Radio. Now, Jonathan has been with AFR for 21 years. And here, a couple of weeks ago, it was his very first time ever to be on the air. So folks, pray for Jonathan. Uh, those of you that are behind the scenes people, you know how uh, your nerves can be and how stressful it can be to be in front of a microphone. Jonathan, you actually did a great job. Welcome back. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And he's uh, back. Yeah. He's back, but popular demand. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, they... one person called in and said they wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that, that was nice person. to your mom. <laughs> yeah. I, I, paid her. Her. I paid her. You need to get John, Jonathan yeah. to come back. So, you know, if they asked me twice to be on this in the South, that's what they call scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> get me back on. Now, here's what. Let this be a lesson to those of you who ever 
or the first time you work in the nursery or the first time you get, uh, is it volunteered or voluntold <laughs> to help with the youth? And then you go, whew, I didn't think I was going to be able to pull that off. I was so nervous. And then the next week, hey, you did such a good job working with the youth. Yeah. We need you to come back. So, yeah. Jonathan, that's what happens. Yeah. Same thing that happens yeah. with those nursery workers. Hey, we're going to ask three questions each. We're going to ask you to answer or, or, or ask ask or answer one of these questions. We're having a lot of fun, a lot of hard-hitting issues throughout the week. On Friday, we just let our hair down and have fun. Laughter is good medicine. But, Brother Bert, one of these original nine questions is a special question. Explain that. They really are. And if you answer that question correctly, you will hear this amazing sound. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. The the cowbell. That is a mystery question. It is. And then, if you win, you want to stay online. Don't hang up too quick. We're going to get you an address, mailing address, and we'll send you one of these amazing tumblers. And let me do it the way Tim does. You got a tumbler for those watching. We found out, uh, I think about two or three weeks ago, what a group of tumblers official name is. You know, you have a gaggle of geese, yes, you know, yes. a, a fleet of tumblers. A fleet? Yeah, of I think tumblers. it was Larry from uh, Louisiana said he had a fleet of tumblers. Oh, anyway, that's good. So anyway, we found that out. I didn't know that was Brother true. Bert, will you give the number out, please? It is 888-589-8840. 888-589-8840 and it is first time callers only. Right. And we do that because Trivia Friday, listen, I go I do exploring the word, you know, and I'll hear people say, Man, I love exploring the word. Uh it's my second favorite show. And what comes up first is always Trivia Friday. And uh, it's a great show. I'm with you. I get to crisscross the country speaking at events. In fact, last night I was in Corinth, Mississippi uh, at the Shiloh Ridge Golf Club. It was a family fun night for two pregnancy centers, Oasis Medical Center in Corinth, Mississippi, Parkgate Pregnancy Center in Tupelo, Mississippi. We met some wonderful AFR listeners. Well, let's get started again. First time caller only. If you have never called and gotten through and been on the air with us for Learning University, this is for you to call this number. Brother Bert, it, do you mind doing that one more triple time? It is. Triple eight. Triple eight. Five eight nine eight eight four zero. And if you call right now, you ought to be able to get on. This is unusual. We have lines that are open even now. That's wonderful. But we better start with a question. Yes, sir. If you'll start, Brother Bert and Jonathan, and then I'll I'll go next, and we'll give our three questions each. Okay. My first question is the Andrew Griffith Show. I tried to get by without asking one one time, and I got criticized deeply. And so here it is. On the Andrew Griffith Show, what farmer was the winner of the Ladies League Music Album. Okay? Now, you, you don't have to be real good, but it's usually one of the top ten programs, and this is it. What farmer was the winner of the Ladies League Music Album? And then the second question, what day in U.S. history was the most flowers sold? What day in U.S. history was the most flowers sold? Third question, my Bible question, which one of Jesus' 12 apostles was possibly a twin? One of them was oh, possibly a twin. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Good questions, Brother Bert. All right, here are my three. Uh, the first one is, on October 26, 1881, what famous American West event happened between three lawman brothers and cowboy bandits? Do that one again. All right, so it is, on October 26, 1881, what famous American West event happened between three lawman brothers and cowboy bandits? Was John Wayne involved in those? <laughs> <laughs> there's no John Wayne. He wasn't, he wasn't born by then. Okay. I, I just, no. Okay. no, there's no John Wayne. Really, we know how yeah. Jonathan loves all things the Duke. <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes. All right. So, second question is, what was the original purpose of the tiny pockets in jeans? What was the original purpose of the tiny pockets in jeans. My third question is a Bible question. In the book of Proverbs, it is better to obtain wisdom than what? Okay, great. In the book great of Proverbs, it is better to obtain wisdom than what? 
Here's what I've got. First question, what does the touch of Midas turn everything into? You've heard people say, well, he's got the Midas touch, she's got the Midas touch. What does the touch of Midas turn everything into? And it's not a muffler. There's an elf. <laughs> Who knew a muffler store could have so much influence on our culture? <laughs> Second question, how many toes do ostriches have on each foot? How many toes do ostriches have on each foot? Third question, true or false, peaches are members of the almond family. Is that true or false? Peaches are members of the almond family. True right. or false? Hey, man, some great questions. Y'all ready, guys? We're ready. Okay. Let's go to Mark in North Carolina. Welcome, Mark. Hey, how you doing? Doing well. What part of North Carolina are you from? I'm actually from Randlow, but I live in uh, Maiden, North Carolina now. Okay. Well, everybody in North Carolina knows where that is, I'm sure. That's right. That's right. Hey, hey. Mark, you want to ask, answer, <laughs> or do both, sir? I'll do both. Which one you feel confident about answering? Uh, the one about the peaches. Oh, okay. Um, it's true or false. Peaches are members of the almond family. Is that true or false, Mark? I'm going to say false. It is 100% true. Oh, no. How, how bizarre wow, is yeah. that that a peach is a member of the almond family? Hey, Mark, what's your... Uh, what's your never get that. I, I know it. Well, the next person that calls in will get that wrong. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, hey, Mark, what, uh, what is the, uh, what's your question for us? Uh, a buddy of mine told this, he's no longer with us. It's a riddle. What can you put in a barrel that makes it lighter? That's a real good riddle. Say that again. What can you put in a barrel that makes it lighter? Lighter. Lighter, yeah. Gasoline. Like a, or a, a lantern. Kerosene. <laughs> or a flashlight. Yeah. Yeah, I'm stumped. What's the answer? A hole. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. Hey, Mark, thank you for listening to AFR. Have a great weekend. You know what Mark Twain said about barrels and teenagers? Yes, didn't? I do. He said, put them in there and put a hole in the barrel, you know, so they can breathe. And when they become 16, shut the barrel up. That's not the right. hole put up. the plug <laughs> yeah, in, put the, in the, the hole. In. Yeah, yes, right. sir. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Next is Mississippi, and it's Michael. Welcome, Michael. Doing well. What Good. part of Mississippi are you from? Olive Branch. Oh, hey, man, up in the northwest corner. Hey, Michael, my daughter Maddie is uh, the children's director for, for um, uh, Emanuel Baptist Church there in Olive Branch. Good, good, good pick, right, Doctor. Sir? I know exactly where that is. Yeah, Doctor. Exactly that that, that's a great church. Hey, listen, you want to ask, answer, or do both, sir? I guess just an answer. Okay, which one do you want to answer? Uh, the question about the Midas touch. Oh, okay. Here's the question. What does the touch of Midas turn everything into? Gold. Gold. Yeah, way yeah. to go. Way to, get, way to get us going in the right direction. Well, hey, have a great weekend. Thank you for listening to AFR. Thank you, Michael. Let's go to Texas and talk to Ron. Welcome, Ron. How are you doing this morning? Doing fantastic. Let me ask you, where in Texas do you live? The, the northeast, the northeast part. Of, northeast part. Uh, Shreveport. Well, I, Jan, and I will be in Texas next week with a fishbowl retreat down in River Bend, that's south of Fort Worth, and uh, so we'll be deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> but we're glad you called, yeah. Ron. Do you want to? Yeah, we're we're over. We're over in the northeast part where we've got tall pine trees and and uh, boy, when the when the sky is clear at night, the stars really are the stars really are big and bright. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, do you want to ask, answer, or both, Ron? 
I will. I will try to do both. Okay. Which Which question? I was. I wanted to answer your Andy Griffith question. Okay. Are you an Andy Griffith show if, fan? If I, I, oh, absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. They don't. They just don't make them like that anymore. I'm getting my plug in about Andy Griffith. <laughs> yes, sir. We so agree. Anyway, Our I listeners have, do too. Yeah. Okay. Here's the question. On the Andy Griffith Show, what farmer was the winner of the Ladies League Musical? The only one that I can think of would be Ray Hollister. Woo! That is Nicely exactly done, right. right? Ray Hollister. It's one of the best shows they have. Barney thinks he's going to get it, and he sounds horrible. <laughs> Ray shows up in his overalls, and he goes over there, and those ladies just can't take uh, because Rafe had a part-time job as well as being a farmer, moonshiner. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. So, anyway, it was Rafe Hollister. Way to go, Yeah, Ron. nicely done, Ron. What's your question for us? I, I believe the name of that episode is Rafe Hollister Sings. It is. I agree with you. Wow, me, you guys are some serious well, let me tell you Andy this. Griffith fans. Yeah, at, the, at West Jackson Street Baptist Church, where I was pastor for 28 years, for five years, we did a, what we called a maybe a Christmas, and one of those was taken off of Rafe Hollister singing, and uh, it turned out How real good. We would, we would pack the church out uh, five times. We did five times every year. Wow. Folks were saved because we got the gospel in there. And it, it was powerful. People still talk about it. But that's a great answer. In our town where you were pastor for many, many years, uh, the paper would just, it'd be front page how you guys would do that up, right? Because the characters looked alike. They they had their mannerisms, the, all the words from the show. And that was a fun five years for West Jackson Baptist Church in Tupelo, Mississippi. It was. Hey, the Andrew Griffith, he works here at AFR. He sure now. does. Yes, Walter. Sure. Walter That's Billings, right. he does. Okay, oh, Rob, Ron. what's your question for us? All right, I have, I have, a, I have a college football trivia question. There are there are three three coaches that have coached at both Texas A and M University and the University of Alabama, and two of them won national championships. Can you can you name the three coaches and name the two that won the national championships? <laughs> we need Tim Wild yeah, in did. here. Yeah, uh, though, Tim or Ed, either one. But I know one. Uh, you had uh, Bear Bryant coached at A and M and over at Alabama. My wife's great uncle uh, played for him at A&M and then he'd have him come over to Alabama to do pep talks for his team so there's one but I don't know what the other two I, are. I, I, I do not there. know Tim could tell you the yeah. day and the <laughs> shoe size yeah. and everything yeah. else yeah. Of the, it okay. is no, I watch it but I don't study it the way yeah. he does how about Paul Bear Bryant for one uh, what about the other one the other two Ron one, one of them one of them has a ranch in Paris Texas I still don't yeah, know. Yeah, you're going to have to give That's us the That's better answer. Paris Rance, anyway. He, he, all right. He, he, Gene Stallings, and he, and he won a national team. He coached at A&M. And, and, then, and, he won a, and, he, and he actually beat Bear Bryant in the Cotton Bowl um, back in, like, 1968 or 69, something like that. Right. Uh, came down with came to Alabama won a championship there in 1992, the 1992 season. And the third one was Dennis Franchione, and he coached at Alabama first and, and then went to Texas A&M. Wow, okay. wow, that is some good college trivia. Hey, it uh, sounds like you uh, know your college football. Texas A&M, have you ever heard, this goes way, way back, of the Junction City Boys? Oh, yeah. They did the movie about it? Oh, well, my wife's great uncle was one of the Junction wow. City Boys. He was one of them. And he actually played with Gene Stallings, and they would take them off campus and work them so hard, their nose would bleed, they wouldn't wow. give them water. Uh, and in the movie, where one, uh, you know, they're playing without helmets, without pads, and one has to go to the emergency room, uh, it was M Melanie's great uncle. Wow. And it's a true story. Well, because they have such rough treatment there, they changed college football rules because of that Texas A&M thing. So you can't take them off and do like a prison camp, like boot camp. 
you can't do that after that harsh wow. thing with the Junction City boy. So you you could still watch that movie. Hey, J uh, Ron, thanks for listening to AFR. You stumped us, but a lot of our college football fans they were yelling at the radio <laughs> they with knew that. telling the answer. Thanks, buddy. Have a great weekend. Speaking of college football, let's go to Ohio. I think there's a <laughs> university there that kind of like they know it. a little something. They do. Yeah, Isaac, Isaac, welcome. Hey guys, how you doing? Doing well, thank you. What part of Ohio are you from, Isaac? I'm in Plain City, which is uh, just about 10, 15 minutes west of Columbus. Okay, right there in the middle of Ohio. Good area. It okay, is. Okay, country. Well, do you want to ask, answer, or both, Isaac? Uh, I would like to answer, but I, I was uh, concentrating on, on other stuff. Um, so I just have, I guess I just have a question for you guys today. All right, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. I guess we need to restate them in a minute or two. Yes, sir. You know what? We can do that right now. Give him a chance to take okay. a stab. Okay, and Isaac, stay on, and we're going to rehearse and review these questions. What day in U.S. history was the most flowers sold? Which one of Jesus' 12 apostles was possibly a twin? And I'll ask, add a third one. At what temperature are Celsius and Fahrenheit equal? There's one. There's a temperature where they're equal. They're always unequal, but at one place they're equal. What's yours? All right. Here's my question. On October 26, 1881, what famous American West event happened between three Lawman brothers and cowboy bandits? Question two: What is the original purpose of the tiny pocket and jeans? And my last one is a uh, Bible question. In the book of Proverbs, it is better to obtain wisdom than what? Good questions. Here's what I've got, Isaac. Uh, number one, how many toes do ostriches have on each foot? And then I'm going to add a couple. Number two, what is the nickname for Lambeau Field? We're talking about football. What is the nickname for Lambeau Field? Third question, until 1792, Kentucky was part of which state? All right, there you go, Isaac. Which one of those do you feel confident about? All right, I think I got the one about the, uh, the Fahrenheit and Celsius. Okay, this is it. Uh, the question, at what temperature are Celsius and Fahrenheit equal? Uh, the, the, uh, oh, man. Never mind, I was thinking um, 100, 100 degrees, but that's not, no, I that's, just, yeah, I just feel it. That's not it. That's it, not it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just give a hint to everybody. God got a lot lower than 100 right. degrees. <laughs> well, Isaac, you say you want to go ahead and ask us one. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, I've got it for you. Okay. So I want to know the, uh, the distance from the sun to the, the planet, which is somewhat debated if it's actually a planet, but the planet Pluto. Oh, wow. How many, how many, you need it in yards or, or, <laughs> or what? To get, how, how close do you want me to get? <laughs> Listen, they call that light year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, so say, say the question again, Isaac. Okay, how many miles or kilometers, actually, what are the kilometers, is, um, is Pluto from the sun? Well, there's a deal. For one thing, <laughs> How bad of a planet do you have to get be to get kicked out of the original planets? I mean, how much carousing you got to do over the weekend? Uh, we don't be, want you anymore. To be kicked out. Hey, and who was on that committee? I never ever heard that we were voting on anybody or nobody campaigned. Somebody somewhere said, uh, I make a motion to kick Pluto out of the... Okay, I second motion. All right, what's the next order of business? They're following That's crazy. The, they're following the science. Follow the Follow science. Follow the science. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you guys, I don't think I, either of us know no, the answer to that. No, I don't know that. 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 Yeah. Hey, hey, Isaac, what is it? Well, it's uh, 5.9 billion uh, kilometers. That's so. more miles than I got on my Chevy truck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think I've driven that far no. before. Hey, that's a lot of frequent flyer miles right there. Isaac, 